Welcome to uh, even more, yet even more stories from the Secret City. Uh, this is Monday, the 12th of June, and uh, we have uh, a special guest with us today that we'll get to in just a minute, David Hackett. But let me go through just a few other things first. Remind you to keep your uh, microphone muted unless you're speaking to the group. Use the speaker view if you want to see a large image of the person speaking. Use the gallery view to see all participants. And then you can click on the line between the shared screen and the gallery view or the speaker view. And you can drag that to your left and make the speakers larger or make the image uh, smaller or larger just by moving your mouse on that line. And I'll try to watch the chat, but just as easier a way for you to comment is to just ask questions. Just unmute your microphone and speak up, and we'll uh, we'll stop and address your questions. Your questions will may be much more interesting than anything David and I are doing anyway. So we would love to have your questions at any time. So please don't hesitate. Uh, let me let me get see folks in here. All right. So people are still joining, so I'll continue to watch for that. And I'm, I'm more, I mentioned something at the very last of our session last week about these uh, historical markers around town, and, and Katie mentioned it as well. The Explore Oak Ridge and uh, the Manhattan Project National Historical Park have put about 20 to 25 of these around town. And I know there are five more that are ready to go out now that the city will be installing. And I challenge you to try to find all of them. Just go around town and looking for them and, and read them when you get there. <clears throat> They'll all have good information about uh, whatever the subject is that they're pointing to. Now, I deliberately picked this uh, uh, International Friendship Bell as the one I wanted to focus you on today. And the reason I did that is because Shigeko Upaluri has uh, uh, has passed away within the last week or so. And there is going to be an event on at the Bell on Thursday, June the 15th at 7 p.m. Uh, they'll be there uh, for a brief comfort circle, is what they're calling it, honoring Chigeko. And I'd like to encourage all of you to consider coming down and participating in that uh, in that event. Now, David Hackett is our guest, and he's going to talk to us about the very early history of our area. And uh, David, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and let you bring yours on as you need to. And uh, Give us the information that you prepared for us. All righty. Well, let me introduce David just a little better than that. You, many of you may know him. He's a volunteer around town, works at the American Museum of Science and Energy and, and other places, just engaged a lot in our history. And one of the people that I go to for, especially for very early history, uh, he's well versed in it. He is descended from the Yuchi tribe of uh, Indians, which were located along the Clinch River, not the Cherokee, the Yuchi. And because of David, in every presentation I make about the history of Oak Ridge, I point out uh, that the Indians that were along this area of the Clinch River were the Yuchi Indians and not the Cherokee. So, David, tell us more about the early history. And, and if you want to share anything more about yourself that I didn't cover, please feel free to do that. Well, basically, uh, the textbooks that are available have pushed the Cherokee as being the Indians of Tennessee. And actually, the Cherokee were only marginally in Tennessee in the uh, very highest parts of the mountains and in the very latest of times, uh, about the same time as uh, the European settlers were moving into the region, the Cherokee moved into the region. 
Uh, the Cherokee are the, one of the more popular tribes and one of the few tribes that most people can name. And that comes about because they were very accommodating. They tried to be uh, as Western in civilization as possible, uh, joining the dominant culture in many of the traits. And so uh, uh, they were a little surprised when they were deported to Oklahoma along with everybody else. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Tennessee was uh, treated for, uh, not that the treaties were above board particularly, but uh, the treaties were with the Cherokee who didn't live in Tennessee or weren't uh, entitled to the land and not the uh, remainders of the tribes that were here before, which became the Chickamauga tribe uh, in the latter days before uh, the 1700s. The uh, Chickamauga tribe uh, is made up of uh, a number of tribes, including Creek tribes, uh, some Suian tribes, and primarily the Uchi tribe. Uh, the Uchis were the Indians that were here uh, from uh, probably 400 years before uh, white settlement. And they uh, uh, sort of were a key tribe to the mound building society that was here during Mississippian times. They uh, attained that position by being the chief traders among the Indians. And so the trade trails all came together here in Tennessee because of the physiography of the Great Valley. And the there are three basic features that made the Uchi strong and made this the center of, of trade. One was the physiography with the Great Valley coming down through and the constraining wall, mountain walls on either side meant that all traffic pretty much came up and down the Great Valley. The second was salt. Salt is an important commodity. Uh, when you cease being just a meat eater like the hunting societies that were here for more than 20,000 years before uh, the agricultural people uh, developed here. Uh, they didn't need to have salt, but they followed the big beasts, the mastodons and mammoths up and down these trails uh, because they needed the salt and they traveled from salt lick to salt lick. So the whole trail structure uh, is based on uh, trails that lead from one salt lick to another salt lick. And these salt licks became important as the agrarian people uh, rose on the uh, land. And the traders then would move from salt lick to salt lick collecting salt. The Uchis dominated all these salt licks. And so they dominated trade of all items, but salt being the premier item, they dominated that. Uh, given that they had th that domination of trade they their religion the green corn ceremony became another center in that they developed a uh, religious rite that they could proselytize to all the other tribes and so a theocracy grew up that became the mound building society mound building was part of that theocracy so there's uh, probably 10,000 to 20,000 mounds throughout uh, Eastern North America. And there are three basic areas they're in, down the Mississippi River, down the Ohio River, and up the Tennessee River. And so uh, I'll show you a map. Uh, I guess I can show that right now. Uh, now, if I find the map. Yeah. Uh, well, got it. Uh, 
they're so small on here and now i've got hard to see them another screen in front of me hang on just a second and see if i can Uh-huh. <laughs> Last one I was looking at. All right. When you bring it up, then share your screen. Hmm. Should be about to center down to bottom. There you go. Oh. You're sharing oh. it. <laughs> yeah, we see them. Thank you. Very good. It'll take me a little while to get, get the hang of it here. That's all right. We'll work with you. Here's the Mississippi River, of course. And here's the Tennessee River right in here and the Ohio River right here. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's three prongs of these mound buildings. And here in East Tennessee, we have a population center. And indeed, we're one of the more uh, regions with greater indigenous population during the mound building period. Wow. That's kind of interesting. So basically, uh, the Uchis were important here. Uh, every one of you knows the Uchi word even from the Uchi language. Anybody got an idea? Uh, Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee is a Uchi word. <laughs> Tana means brother, and Uchi, in Uchi, and Tsi means water, brother waters, the confluence of two streams. Yeah. Something we have a lot of here in East Tennessee, yeah. as the Tennessee River branches uh, and fills the Great Valley. So basically, uh, uh, that's my <laughs> introduction. Yes, Dean Little. Uh, could you spell Uchi? I I can I hear it. What is I'm not familiar with the spelling. I spell it, and and most academics spell it Y U C H I. Uh, if you go down to Uchi Boat Dock down near Ten Mile, it's spelled E U C H E E. And out in Oklahoma, the Creek people uh, tend to spell it that way, as well. And in fact, most of the are all the Uchis that are registered as official Indians with the federal government are Creek Indians because the federal government chose to uh, identify them only as Creek. Most Uchis or Uchi descendants have no recognition and I myself choose not to be recognized. But the uh, uh, spellings vary quite a bit U-C-H-I is also seen occasionally. Uh, they also have a number of uh, names by other tribes. The uh, Algonquin people call them the Hogohigi. And if you look on the earliest maps of East Tennessee, the Tennessee, well, the Holston River and the portion of the Tennessee River was called the Hogohigi River. And so you find a lot of uh, fossil words, fossil words as names on the landscape. Uh, Unica is another Uchi word, the Unica Mountains. Unica basically means great rattlesnake. And if you've ever hiked the Smokies, there are a lot of great rattlesnakes there. <laughs> yeah. I'll let other questions develop here. Anyone else? Well, I guess uh, we're not in a questioning mood this morning. That's all right. Go ahead and share with us. But if they have questions, they'll speak up. I think I'll start pitching up some pictures here. Gotcha. See if I can get my screen readjusted here. First of all, I need to get rid of that one. All right. Let's talk a little bit about mound building itself. Uh, uh, you're sharing two, your 
now. We see the Indian mounds. There are two types of Indian mounds. Uh, there's the temple mounds. These were uh, latter-day mounds uh, during the, the height of the mound building society. And they were actually built up layer by layer. Each time a priest died, they burned down the temple on top of the mound and buried the priest on top of the mound and built the mound up a little higher build a new temple with a new priest and that kept going over cycles so some mounds have four and five layers in the temple mound structure also uh, the priest's relatives would often be buried in the shoulders of the mound there might be more than one mound in a big village because there might be more than one uh, priest but the biggest mound was always for the chief priest Earlier in the mound building uh, culture, there were just small mounds uh, for the priestly class. And these were all burial mounds. They didn't have a temple on top of them. Uh, these are the more common mounds. There's uh, oh, several dozen of them here in Oak Ridge. There are no temple mounds in Oak Ridge. There were a couple temple mounds uh, across Clinch River uh, in uh, Edgemore and uh, oh, Jake Butcher's uh, property over there, actually his uh, in-laws property, the Wiles, uh, has a, uh, had a temple mound on it. Uh, oh show you one of the features of that temple mound. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, hang on, I need to share it. You'll have to share it again. <laughs> You're getting the hang of it. It's okay. Yeah, well, I'm not too dense. <laughs> I hear you. We're getting there. This is, a, this is a baked clay fire pit that was in the temple mound uh, at uh, uh, Leah farms which was uh it's part of the property that the wild zone directly across from the marina and the interesting feature of that that tells me it's Uchean in nature is these uh, feed lines going into it this is where they put the logs that uh from the four directions into the fire and they lay a log there and as it burned they press it in further and further. Hmm. This is rather exclusive uh, design to the Uchis themselves. Uh, are, are we looking at a dirt mound? Is that dirt? Well, the, this, the mound was not very high over there. It was okay. probably uh, three foot at best. The mound is completely gone and so is the fire pit. Uh, UT and TVA excavated it and destroyed it completely. Now let's uh, go to the Leah Farm site here. Okay. Got it. Uh, if you look, there's a little green spot right there. That's where the pit was. Now, this is the Wiles old house here. And this is Jake Butcher's house, the marina. Yeah. Uh, so there was a mound right here. And that mound uh, had the fire pit in it. There's a, another shot of the fire pit. This is what it looks like from the ground view today. That's why the green, there's a one big tree on it. There's a slight hole where the mound used to be. And a lot of rocks scattered around. Uh, it is on private property, but I've never had anybody challenge me if I walked in uh, and behaved myself. <laughs> I probably should have asked, but uh, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, as long as we're talking about such mounds, 
Oh. No. And when I pulled these out, I didn't organize them real well, so Understand. that makes it a little more difficult. Understand. This was the other mound that was here. Uh, this was the Cox mound, and it actually had a set of steps going up it. It was probably uh, 30 or 40 feet tall, and it was located right where the Bull Run steam plant is now, so it's utterly gone. Uh, it was excavated uh, in the 30s by TVA. And again, in, in the 60s, some of the surrounding area was excavated for the Bull Run steam plant. Now, that was a larger mound. Huh. This was a larger mound. It probably was of the uh, Kosati people. The Yuchi and the Kosati lived together sometimes in the same villages. Uh, they were a very close grouping of tribes. They spoke different languages. Uh, the Kosati speaking a, a Muscogean language, but uh, the Yuchis were generally multilingual because their language was so difficult, no one ever learned it except for the Yuchis. Hmm. And so the, the multilingualism also fed into their being freighters because they needed to speak lots of different languages in order to trade uh, in the multilingual southeast where some 40 or 50 languages were being spoken. These steps are, are interesting in that the logs in them were still uh, quite viable wood. In fact, uh, at the Oak Ridge uh, History Museum, I've got a piece of wood. It's not from one of these steps. It's from a, a beam that was uh, at another site I'll mention shortly. But these were all subjected to dendrochronology, uh, which allows them with carbon-14 dating to date precisely when those trees were cut down. And so they have a very precise date on this. I wish I knew what it was at the moment, but I don't. Uh, but the Cox Mound was probably the biggest mound in the area of Oak Ridge. Uh, there are some 40 to 50 sites, Indian sites, in and around Oak Ridge. Let me see if I can point out a little bit where they are. There's a question about the age of the Cox Mound. Can you give any approximation? You said you didn't have the exact date. I guess the McClung Museum would have that date. They have the exact date, and somewhere in my files I have it, but uh, it it's not something that I've <laughs> felt was important enough to keep in my uh, gray matter. I understand. Sandy, uh, we'll, we'll try to get that answer for you. Uh, I'm sure David will look it up in, after we get off here, and I'll I'll get that information to you. I'm having trouble finding one of my. Oh, so, there it is. There you go. <laughs> right when you're about to give up, it shows up. <laughs> All right, this is a a map that I rendered. Uh, there's a a better map that uh, I'm not supposed to share, and it's. Uh, part of a uh, publication by Nick Fielder, who was our state archaeologist, but he did the uh, archaeology of Oak Ridge before he became state archaeologist. They don't want me to show it because they don't want pot smashers to come in and ruin the sites. Yeah. Although a lot of the sites here in Oak Ridge have already been pot smashed thoroughly. Uh, the sites I've chosen here to talk about are probably among the safer ones to talk about. But basically these sites are located all along the river here where you see the yellow highlighting. Uh, 
We've already talked about the Braden Branch and Leah Farm site here, uh, located right here across from the marina. And we've talked about the Cox site right here. Uh, as we move around, there's uh, the Friels Bend site here and the Crawford Mound site here. Uh, Roberts Branch way down here. Uh, that's the one across from K-25. And when I was working at K-25, uh, on any given day, I used to see somebody over there digging uh, for artifacts illegally on uh, TVA land. And if you go there today uh, and walk over the four or five acres here, it's nothing but mounds and little mounds and pits where people have dug and and looking for artifacts to sell. There is a little uh, woodland mound here too, but this was a Mississippian village. Uh, this is where the piece of, of uh, cedar log that I have on display at the Oak Ridge History Museum came from. Uh, it is uh, not much of a site today, but uh, we're still struggling to preserve it from development from the preserve subdivision that's going up out there. Uh, one I skipped over here, uh, Bull Bluff. Uh, I'll show another slide of, of this image right here. These are artifacts that came from Bull Bluff that TVA uh, had excavated by UT. I might point out at this point that the artifacts that UT has have mostly been taken out of the McClung Museum and returned to the tribes, uh, excluding the Uchi. We, we're not entitled to get any items that are Uchi because we're not a federally recognized tribe. So they're returning these items to the uh, Creek and the Chickasaw, et cetera. Uh, one last site I'll highlight here is Pawpaw Town. Uh, Pawpaw Town was the uh, last Indian community here in the uh, Oak Ridge area. Uh, it was here until almost 1800 uh, when uh, the last of the Chickamauga people were run off by John Sevier and his militia. Uh, I might point out uh, uh, that the Chickamauga uh, resented the Cherokee giving their land to the settlers, and in many cases, the settlers were already taking land ahead of, of the treaties. And so the militias would come in, uh, and one of the real problems was the Indians had already hunted and trying to get enough hides to get the supplies they needed, had hunted the deer and the beaver to almost extinction. And so the people were uh, very close to starving and the militia would come in and burn their coal corn fields uh, to the ground. And so the starvation was reigning during the period among the indigenous people. And so the, having such poor nutrition, the diseases ran rampant through the people. And during this period, nine out of 10 indigenous people died, which caused the various tribes to collapse into one another. Uh, this uh, situation led to new tribes being formed from old tribes, and all the tribes did this. Uh, what we call the Cherokee today are not the Iroquoian people entirely that uh, were the original core of the Cherokee. Uh, Cherokee people are made up of uh, probably at least one third of the Catawba people. Uh, in case of the Chickamauga, there was probably eight or nine different tribes that came together to make the Chickamauga tribe. But uh, their last village here in East Tennessee was Pawpaw Town. And Pawpaw Town uh, is of interest to me as a Uchi historian, ethno-historian, because Pawpaw is a Uchi word. 
Uh, pawpaw means popping in Yuchi. It also refers to the pawpaw tree and the pawpaw fruit. And if you've ever stepped on an overripe pawpaw on the ground, you know why they call them popping. <clears throat> so that tells us very distinctly that the Chickamauga town had Yuchi people among them here. And then let's see here. Uh, question. Yes. You'll have to unmute yourself. You're muted. What's the difference between Mississippian and forest? And also, what was the approximate population? You mentioned that during this period where the whites came in, nine out of 90% of the indigenous people died. Uh, what were the populations kind of at their peak? And then also, what's the dis back to the original question, what's the difference between a Mississippian culture and a forest culture? Well, the Mississippian culture uh, is is the period of time. Uh, now, let's throw up the timeline here. I was looking for another slide, not finding it. But here's the timeline. And we go down here at the very bottom on the timeline. Uh, this is the National Geographic from 1978, but I've modified it because they started out here at about uh, 15,000 years ago. We now know. Uh, from footprints we found at White Sands, New Mexico, that people were here 24,000 years ago. And so I've stretched it back and put a break in it here. Uh, but you have the, the earliest periods in time starting a, a little before 10,000 years, maybe 12,000 years ago. It's called the Paleolithic period. Oh, you this is... share your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'd already shared it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. there there should... Yeah, there it is. Thank you. All right. Back down here to 24,000 years ago is when we first finding people that may have been here 30 or 40,000 years ago. We just haven't proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt yet. But the earliest people during the Paleozoic period up to 12,000 years ago uh, were basically hunters hunting mastodons and mammoths. Uh, they all became extinct and the culture we call the Clovis culture disappeared at the Younger Dryas period. That apparently is when a asteroid struck somewhere in the Arctic region and uh, pretty much made very uncomfortable climate conditions for the animals and people, and so there was a mass die out here. The Archaic period begins uh, from 12,000 years ago up to about 3,000 uh, years before present, and again, most of the people are hunters here, uh, living on subsistence, uh, hunting and, and what berries and nets they can gather. But starting in the woodland period, uh, you begin to see the start of agriculture and uh, you begin to see uh, more artistic features such as uh, uh, smoking pipes that are intricately carved. And so, uh, the woodland period here corresponds with the Maya civilization. Uh, my uh, research is leading me to believe that the Yuchi were part of the Olmec people that were trading throughout uh, North America and Central America. Uh, and so that their language, which is known as an isolate because they've not found it connected to any other language, may have been connected to the the extinct Olmec language. So to get to the question here, Mississippian is the, the later period here when the culture was the highest 
the population is going up this whole time as they're getting better food. Uh, corn developed from being little inch long uh, ears to being uh, 10 and 12 inch long ears. And so the people are uh, getting better fed because over the thousands of years, uh, the indigenous people here developed far more uh, nutritious crops than were developed in, in Europe and Asia. And that's why today, uh, more than half of all the food we eat was developed in indigenous cultures here in the Americas. So the Mississippian culture becomes uh, the highest. Uh, there's an argument about populations. Uh, still, uh, most uh, academics want to argue the population down, but it's clear by the impact to the forest that they were harvesting the, the forest and uh, uh, agriculture was going on in the forest where they'd remove uh, trees of one variety for uh, developing more chestnut forests uh, because the chestnuts were a, a substantial crop. So the population of North America probably was close to a hundred million, which was more than three times what Europe was, uh, and probably close to 40% of the population of the earth. Uh, the uh, situation here in North America was that uh, they weren't uh, fighting continual wars like they were in Europe and Asia. So the population grew very rapidly. And uh, in fact, the green corn ceremony is a peace ceremony. It's a religion of peace. And as an example of that, uh, rather than fighting wars, they had ball games called the Little Brother of War. And those ball games were uh, between uh, rival villages. Uh, I don't want you to think that they were uh, pleasant little games like our football. People died playing these ball games, but they didn't die wholesale like they did in wars. Uh, the Peace Pipe got its name because uh, when you travel on the trails, you carried a peace pipe openly that uh, stated that you were uh, not coming to harm somebody but uh, you were traveling in peace. They also used flutes for the same thing. When the traders would move up and down the trails, they'd play flutes to let people know they were coming and that they were coming in peace. Uh, counting coup was another aspect. Uh, if you had a, a grievance against an enemy and instead of going and uh, sneaking into their village and killing them, you go in and touch them with a coup stick and when they woke up and saw you, you'd say, I could have killed you. Uh, hmm. the, probably the final one was the fact that during the green corn ceremony, all transgressions against others were to be forgiven except for murder. So if you committed some crime, all you did, had to do was hold out in some white town, peace town versus just any town until the green corn ceremony and you had to be forgiven. That didn't mean you were just automatically forgiven. You had to give some gifts to the people you uh, transgressed, but uh, you can see that the whole structure of the green corn ceremony is about keeping the peace, the statecraft. And so the Mississippian was when this developed, it all crashed, of course, uh, as white settlement came in and brought their wars, fighting the French, the Spanish, and the English fighting one another. The tribes were drawn into it by alliances. And so um, today, most of the books talk about how savage and warlike the Indians were. Well, they weren't that way before white settlement. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think so. And we have a question about Oliver Springs. Can you focus a bit on the Oliver Springs area? I certainly can. I, I didn't mention that when I had my map up, but uh, let's see if I can find my... 
<laughs> salt slide here. Good. Oliver Springs was a uh, salt lick. And uh, the Indians, the Uchis in particular, would uh, gather big containers of water and pour them into boiling pots and boil the water off. And we're talking about a very weak salt solution. You might have to boil 100 gallons to get uh, an ounce of salt. Hmm. And so this was very intensive work. Of, they had to cut down a lot of trees, etc. But again, salt was so important to the diets that they were doing this to trade. In fact, if you went uh, months and months without getting salt, uh, you would bloat up and you'd start bleeding and ultimately you'd die because you have to have sodium in your diet. Uh, today, we don't worry about such things because we eat too much salt as it is. <laughs> That's true. Did you have an image of Oliver Springs you wanted to show us? Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the pot shards that come from Winters Sherry. Gap and Oliver Springs. Sherry screen. And over here, you'll see now, uh, up here is Saltville. You have to share your screen. We're not seeing that. I'm sorry. Hmm. All right, here's the yeah, Indians making salt. Yeah. Here's the pot shards uh, hmm. from Oliver Springs. Here's the map of the salt licks in and around our region. Uh, up here is uh, Saltville in Virginia. Uh, Red Bowling Springs here, uh, here in Nashville area was known as French Slick. Uh, I can't remember the names of Bathsheba Springs here somewhere, but uh, right in here is Bathsheba Springs. But here's Oliver Springs, and right here is uh, Raya Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Springs was probably a little bigger salt lick than Oliver Springs, but... Uh, we don't have any view of it today. They both had hotels on them back in the 1890s where people came in to bathe in the salt springs. But Ray Springs uh, is under Watts Bar now. Uh, the greatest of all of them, and it's called the Great Salt Lick, is at Saltville up here in Virginia. The location of the Oliver Springs uh, Salt Spring as I understand it, is right where the Windrock road turns to go up to Windrock area. Is that where you think it was as well? No. Where they were doing the boiling, and it wouldn't have been far from the spring itself, right. which was a part of the creek that flows through the gap, is as you come through the gap into Oliver Springs from, from Mortburg, yeah, it was right to your right down along the creek, in that gap, and I That's think where these that, pot shards came from. Right, and I think the spring would have been right, would have been to your left as you come in from. Warfare. There were probably more than one spring feeding uh, that. Good that point. It's a good creek. Point. Uh, but they were they were actually pulling the water out of the creek apparently, uh, because it was salty enough. Probably not after a big rain though. Right, and and the size of the spring was not a large spring. In fact, I found up in Upper East Tennessee at an antique store, I found a basin that was labeled uh, comes from the Oliver Springs spring. Now, whether it did or not, I don't know, but it wasn't very large. It was a fairly small rock. Well, but, the springs that they were using in the 1890s as baths, the, the salt wasn't really the the thing they were sulfur springs and oh. so if you drank the water it would have been real bitter and it would have sm smelled a little sulfurous uh, like rotten eggs is what it smelled like. a little bit but this this salt and the sulfur comes from the fact of the uh, the coal swamps uh, as the water rainwater percolates through the uh, layers of uh, coal rock and then through the sandstones uh, it leaches the salt and sulfur out of the strata and 
that's where why you always find the, the salt springs along the Cumberland front here and not in the valley. Okay. Uh, mentioned Paw Paw Town previously. Uh, Paw Paw Town uh, is located uh, in the vicinity of White Wing Bridge out near Milton Hill Dam. And uh, uh, no one has found the exact location at this point. It's only been found located by uh, early maps. Uh, the, one of the reasons it hasn't been found is, like me, most of them don't want to kick around too long down there because it's right near uh, White Oak Basin yeah. and all the contamination from ORNL. Right. And uh, while that's supposed to be safe now, I don't consider it so. <laughs> I understand. Any other questions? Well, I mentioned. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. There, um, there are a lot of springs in the Oliver Springs area. I remember a Key Springs and maybe another one on the well, Key Springs is on the Black just outside Rose of Oak Ridge here. Uh, right. And Bacon Springs are is too. Uh, Key Springs and, and Bacon Springs are, are two of the uh, more abundant flow springs in the area. Uh, also down East Fork Springs, just, uh, just about where the gates are on the turnpike, the 1950 gates. Uh, is East Fork Springs. Now, those are the, the big springs where settlers watered their animals and whatnot, along with uh, Cross Springs, which uh, is now the Oak Ridge Swimming Pool. Uh, there was a large pond there, natural pond there from very early on. And the Emory Road came through Oak Ridge, and that was a big watering hole on the Emory Road going from Philadelphia to Nashville during settlement period. I uh, mentioned slavery already, but uh, slavery was an important part of, of uh, the demise of indigenous people. Uh, there were probably uh, twice as many indigenous slaves uh, here in America than there were ever were African American slaves. However, most of them were shipped off to the Caribbean because it was hard to keep an indigenous slave They'd run off to one of the tribes and uh, incorporate themselves in, into their culture again. Uh, so they had to ship them out of the uh, North America, in well, out of uh, continental North America into the Caribbean. Uh, let's go back to uh, the trade trails that I referred to. This is the Great Appalachian Valley. Yeah, you let us share your screen. Thank you again. <laughs> Maybe I'll get it through my head. I understand, no problem. <laughs> this yeah. is the Great Appalachian Valley. Uh, runs from Canada all the way down into Alabama. And of course you have the Appalachian Mountains on the Eastern side, and you have the Cumberland Plateau Walden's Ridge on the west side. And those are rather uh, big barriers to traveling east and west. So most all travel goes up and down here. You do have a few gaps, the Hiawassee, the Little Tennessee, the French Broad, the Watauga, Roanoke, the James River, uh, the Kanawha Valley on the side. Uh, also, you have uh, Elk Valley and and Winter's Gap, and uh, 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 the Tennessee River Gap here, and Cumberland Gap. So you do have a few gaps, and, and of course, Winter's Gap was the first one used to go west here. Uh, the big ones going east were the uh, Hiawassee River Gap and the uh, French Broad River Gap, but most travel that of animals during the ice age and people ever since goes up and down 
uh, this valley, and that's why we have I-75 and I-81 still going down it. And here is a satellite picture showing the Great Valley. The Yuchi called it Yuku, and Yuku was uh, Yuchi for Great Valley. So it, it hasn't changed its uh, basic nature and approach. The trail that goes up and down here, the Indian Trail, was called the Great Indian Warrior Trading Path. Uh, some books refer to it as the Gate Great Indian War Path, but that again promotes the idea that the Indians were always at war, uh, and it, it only became a war path really uh, after European settlement. Before that, it was more of a trading path. And uh, this is uh, William Myers map of our region showing the Indian trails. Here's the great Indian trading path right here. Uh, here is the Western great Indian trading path, which essentially is the turnpike through Oak Ridge here. Uh, and this would be the Emory Road path right in here. Uh, so all these paths we use today, and and the uh, this would be 1170 here in highways today, or I-75 and I-81, and this would be uh, Highway 62 going to Nashville. So we're still using the same paths that the Indians used, and they were using the paths that the Mammoth, Mastodon, and Buffalo were using. Now let's uh, throw up some artifacts here to talk about. I promised I'd show this uh, Bull Bluff. These are the items that were found by uh, UT yep. on Bull Bluff. Share, share your screen. Thank you again. <laughs> there we these go. Are, these are the Bull Bluff artifacts. This is a, a Chucky stone, one of the game stones. Uh, I think these are spool, spools from uh, seashells. They use those through their ears often. That's a seashell. This is a bone awl. These are, of course, arrow points. These are some beads, probably uh, uh, pearls or drilled shell. This is a pipe. I'll note that uh, one of the things that tells you you have a Yuchi pipe is this flared bowl. It's either flared on the stem or flared on the bowl, uh, symbolizing the sun. So odds are that this is very likely a Yuchi pipe. This pipe is probably not. This is a spear point. Over here, we have the Clinch River Obsidian points. They're sort of unique to our area here along Clinch River. Uh, this is not obsidian. It is actually a churdy flint. And uh, it uh, you can find it in the Chickamauga and sometimes a little bit in the Knox uh, formations around here. In fact, if you want to find some of it, you can go to the little railroad spur behind the warehouses there near where Warehouse Road comes into uh, Melton Lake Drive, and you can find pieces of this uh, churdy flint outcropping in the rock there. But there are sites along the Clinch River where you can find arrowheads. I will point out at this point, collecting arrowheads on federal property is illegal. And TVA, if you are got arrowheads in your pocket or have a shovel and you're walking along TVA land, uh, you, you could and will be arrested most likely. So I don't recommend it. Uh, most arrowhead heading today is done in farmer's fields where they get permission from the farmer.
I shared it this time. You got it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is uh, my display case in the Oak Ridge History Museum, uh, showing arrowheads. There's a bone hall. Uh, this is a, a silt point, or silt uh, axe head. Uh, this is a pendant, a ceramic pendant. Uh, this is also a pendant, a gorget. Uh, this is a pipe I carved uh, as a replica. Uh, this is a replica pipe. This is a replica pipe. Uh, I did some museum replica carving for many years. I carved over 100 pipes over the years. Uh, this uh, is the Duck River Cache. Uh, the Duck River Cache is uh, all done in a uh, massive chert from the Dover Chert Formation over in Middle Tennessee. The Duck River Cache was found along Duck River. These are all ceremonial points. Uh, they probably were not used for actual uh, hunting or anything. Uh, they too would be too brittle. Uh, but these are more than a foot long, these swords. And you see the turtle here, another turtle here. Uh, some flint napper was showing off his uh, prowess in flint napping and doing these for ceremonial use. Uh, some Duck River has been found locally. This was, get rid of this here. This blade right here, draw back a little bit, yeah. is a Duck River sword found at Toqua. Is that about two to three feet long? 18 yeah, two, and a, two, two and a quarter feet. Oh, my. All right. That's now, this good. isn't a, a Duck River blade. It is a replica. Okay. Jack East uh, was an archaeologist here locally as well as an ORNL employee. And Jack East uh, did a lot of digging for TVA. And he also did a lot of replica work. He cast this from the, the it was actually seven to nine pieces when they found it. It had been broken and was in a, had been burned in a fire. Hmm. And so he took the pieces and glued them back together, made a mold of it, and cast it in epoxy. Oh, okay. now it's it's just a museum exhibit. How about that? Yeah. I would imagine uh, UT had the original. Yeah. Uh, Jack uh, East is uh, uh, now has uh, left his collection to, well, his collection was left to his family, but uh, was stolen here a few years ago. Oh, no. Uh, James East, uh, who I graduated high school with, is an archaeologist and one of my friends that I count on to explain archaeology to me. Hmm. Uh, let's find another picture here. Uh, oh. I have a question for you, David, before you yeah. start into that. Yes, sir. Wokatella. Tell us what that stands for. Well, it is Uchian. And walk means what, when, why. And T means stone. And L means holder or keeper. So uh -huh. it's, I'm holder of the wind stone or what stone, history. Uh -huh. Historian. I got it. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, my map of where I'm pretty sure the Uchi inhabited for many centuries. Uh, and here, just to the east of them, we have the Kosadi Creek. But here in the valley, there was at least eight or nine tribes. Uh, this was a melding pot. Uh, the Uchi and the Kosati were like one tribe often. Same with the Shawnee and the Uchi. 
these three tribes were very intimate, lived in the same villages. Uh, as you moved out from here, they were less friendly. And so as the Cherokee moved down in here, uh, they moved into here from West Virginia about the 16, late 1600s. And they did so under the pressure of settlement pushing from the east and their cousins, the Iroquois, pushing from the north. And they were enemies to their Iroquois cousins. They were Iroquois themselves. They became enemies to them because they were uh, proselytized into the green corn ceremony. And once they became part of another religion, the Iroquois didn't want them anywhere around. They were afraid they'd proselytize the rest of the Iroquois. And so they pushed them south into the Appalachians, uh, where the Yuchi uh, were quite friendly with them, uh, taught them the green corn ceremony. In fact, even in, in the 1920s, when the Cherokee had lost the green corn ceremony uh, here in the North Carolina mountains, they went out to Oklahoma and were retaught by the Yuchi the green corn ceremony. So this gives you a little idea of, of uh, uh, the maps out there. This is the National Geographic map from 1978. It shows the Yuchi a little more constrained. It also shows them with clear borders, something I often decry because there were no borders back then. Uh, uh, Indians didn't really believe you owned the land. Uh, you might uh, dominate it, but land ownership was uh, really something that was tribal. They believed the animals owned the land as well. And so making boundaries and talking about uh, homelands is needs to be always be qualified with the fact that ownership was not something they they had the territorialism was not something uh, more it was uh, keeping people you, you had uh, hostilities with at bay not having a border so you have the Kosati down here in their map they put the cherokee in here um, this is strongly influenced the cherokee were smaller tribe than the Uchi. They were one of the smallest tribes here, so they wouldn't have inhabited that big territory until uh, after European settlement. As the tribes begin to collapse into one another, uh, the Cherokee begin to accumulate more and the Creek begin to accumulate more. The Uchi tended to scatter since they were scattered as traders, and so the some Uchi became part of the Cherokee, some part of the Shawnee, some part of the Creek, some part of the Seminole. Uh, and so today the Uchi are a small tribe only because they dissolved into so many different tribes. And the Cherokee are only the largest tribe because so many people became, came into their tribe or came in even later by claiming to be Cherokee because during the 1700s, you were either Cherokee, a civilized people, or you were a hostile Indian. So if I met up with a settler as a Yuchi back in the early 1700s, I would have not said I was a Yuchi. I would have said, I'm Cherokee. <laughs> that was, uh, of course, influenced by the fact that in this region right here, Cherokee became the uh, lingua franca. And so everybody spoke Cherokee. and that allowed the American government to start referring to everyone here as Cherokee. So what we have here is, is uh, a muddied history of who the Cherokee are and what other tribes were here. Uh, I've recently managed to uh, rescue uh, some Muchi heritage for Tennessee by proving to Tennessee that uh, Tennessee is a Uchi word. Uh, we recently got uh, the Uchi added back into the Tennessee Blue Book and some of the history books here for children. Uh, they had begun to degrade so that they were telling everyone that the Cherokee were the only Indians in Tennessee. Uh, so we've reclaimed a little bit, but we're still fighting uh, 
uh, Cherokee patrimony in, in that uh, uh, Cherokee now want to name Kligman's Dome the Mulberry Place. Uh, I oppose that because why should the Cherokee name it? They're latecomers here. I don't have a problem with it being renamed. Uh, and, and I don't know that I have a problem with it being renamed with a Cherokee name. But why would you call a mountain that has no mulberry trees on it the mulberry place? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. You've done an excellent job of giving us some unique and early history of uh, uh, of the area that's now Oak Ridge. So. Again, uh, thank you very much for that. Let me uh, let me go to this screen. Uh, wait just a minute. I have to do it differently. I'm I, I'm just like David. It, it this Zoom is good. It's the only good thing I think to come out of the pandemic. <clears throat> but. Uh, Let's see. Let's do it right. Unless here. you do it regularly, it's yeah, it's hard to keep up, hard with. keep up with. Let's see. I got it. I'm back now. Now, I also wanted to remind you about the Oppenheimer movie. We're not going to have time to listen to just a little bit of this uh, uh, interview with Heather McClanahan, but I will do that next time well we don't come back next monday we come back on the 26th now the reason for the one week delay is that i have a trip that i have to make going to brazil and uh, i'll be down there for a week but i'll get back on the 23rd and we'll be ready for this session on the uh on the 26th yeah we'll come back on the 26th so i'll move this one this little segment about Oppenheimer and and include it because I want you to I want you to know as much as I can give you about that before the movie that comes out on July the 21st. And remember, we're going to do a preview or a, a premiere of the movie one day early at Tinseltown on July the 20th. You'll see that being marketed through Explore Oak Bridge. And all proceeds that uh, profits made on that will go to the Oak Ridge History Museum. So I encourage you to to make your plans to be a part of that. Are there any topics for next session that you want me to be sure that I include? If you don't put them in the chat now, you can send me an email uh, or let me know any way you can. I I have recorded this and we'll post it up on youtube and send a link out for you to have uh, i just did that for the uh, first session and it should be coming up in a day or so and this one will not be far behind it any questions before we wrap up we're right at 9 40 or 10 40. again thank you david appreciate so much you taking the time to come and uh spend time with us today and give us information that I believe you are uniquely qualified to share with us. I don't know anyone else that has done the amount of effort and research that you've done. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. And I think we've enjoyed having you with us today. You're most welcome. All right. Very good. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next on the Monday, the 26th.